The United States really is a vast nation. It's 9.8 million square kilometers is roughly the equivalent of the entire continent of Europe. If you take an airplane from New York to Los Angeles, it's about a 4,500 kilometer trip. By comparison, a trip from London to Moscow is only about 2,800 kilometers. And of course, if you fly from New York to Los Angeles, then you're going to fly over what is often and somewhat derisively called flyover country. But of course, each of those states in the vast middle of America was at one point the American frontier, and they are all important to American history. But one in particular really became the dividing line, the marker between East and West and North and South. South. The state that the locals call Missouri is incredibly important to American history, not just its prehistory and its early colonial history, but also at the time that Missouri was becoming a state, it really was representative of the challenges that were facing the young nation in the early part of the 19th century, including a little remembered conflict that nearly sparked a war between the states 20 years ahead of the Civil War. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Missouri was once a central part of the flourishing Mississippian culture that included a 13th century city that was comparable in size to the city of London at the time. The eastern border of the state is the Mississippi River, which means that Missouri saw contact with Europe earlier than you might think, so deep into North America. In fact, Missouri played a role in the American Revolution as part of the little known far western theater where the British made raids across the Mississippi in hopes of controlling the river corridor including a 1780 battle against what was in the tiny settlement of St. Louis, which had been founded by the French but was then under the control of the Spanish, who were allied with the Americans in their war for independence. Missouri became part of the United States with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, and quickly Missouri demonstrated its position as the jumping off point for all points west as the Corps of Discovery Expedition under Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, charged by President Thomas Jefferson to explore the new territory, began their expedition there. Missouri would continue to be the dividing line between East and West, and the starting point of U.S. westward expansion. The Oregon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail, and the California Trail all originated in Missouri, as did the Pony Express. The group of fur traders called Ashley's Hundred were recruited in Missouri, and would go on to explore and map a great portion of the Mountain West. The connection to westward expansion today is memorialized by the 630-foot tall Gateway Arch in St. Louis. Following Louisiana statehood in 1812, the remaining territory of the Louisiana Purchase was called Missouri Territory. When the Missouri legislature petitioned for statehood in 1818, the proposed state would not only have been the first U.S. state entirely west of the Mississippi River, but also the largest state in the Union at the time, larger even than Virginia, even though Virginia in that day still included the western counties that would eventually form the state of West Virginia. The borders of what would become the state of Missouri really represented the challenges of the time, from relations with other European powers that had interests in North America, to relations with the Native American nations, to the thorny issue in early U.S. history of slavery, and even natural disasters, which offered a unique challenge on the frontier. It's as if all the growing pains of the young nation were all represented in just this one state. The Great Mississippi River has many meanders, those sinuous curves, bends, loops, turns, or windings in the channel of a river. One type of meander is called an oxbow, so-called because of its distinctive crescent curve, and one such oxbow loop on the Mississippi creates the odd promontory that is the far southwestern corner of Kentucky, called Kentucky Bend. Across the river is the town of New Madrid. New Madrid, as the name applies, was a Spanish settlement, settled in Spanish territory in 1798. On February 7, 1812, the town was leveled by a massive earthquake, part of a series of earthquakes that are still the largest recorded to have hit the continental United States east of the Rocky Mountains. The earthquakes also spurred an exodus of the great majority of the settlers in the area of New Madrid, which ended up benefiting a landowner named John Hardiman Walker. Walker elected to stay in the New Madrid area and gradually increased his land holdings, acquiring the land of the people who chose to leave. In 1818, he controlled nearly a thousand square acres in the area of New Madrid along the Kentucky Bend. When the territorial legislature applied for statehood, the proposed southern border of the state was to be the latitude line 3630, which formed the border between Kentucky and Tennessee. However, this placed Walker's land not in Missouri, but in the Arkansas Territory. Walker, a powerful political figure, argued that the Mississippi River communities had more in common with the river cities of Cape Girardeau and St. Louis than the Arkansas Territory, and successfully petitioned to have the area included as part of Missouri. It's unclear how much of a direct role Walker played in the decision, which seems to have been supported by the majority of the population, who depended upon the river trade and who preferred to join a state rather than be part of still Arkansas Territory. 
Some accounts suggest that the people of the area argued that Arkansas had a sickly reputation and was full of bears and panthers and copperhead snakes. Arkansas did not object to the change, so the border was dropped some 50 miles to the 36th parallel, which it follows until it hits the St. Francis River, which it follows back to the 3630 parallel. This creates the odd salient called the Missouri Boot Heel. But the 3630, or parallel 36 and one half degrees north of the equator, has another significance. That was a line drawn for the Missouri Compromise, and thus a line that theoretically divided the U.S. North and South. Because when the Missouri legislature petitioned for statehood in 1818, they raised one of the most divisive questions of the nation at the time. Missouri, which had a history of slavery going back to the French colonial period, asked to be admitted as a slave state. The question of slavery had plagued the nation since its founding, and the contest between those who wished to expand slavery, or at least let it be decided in each state by popular sovereignty, and those who looked to limit or abolish slavery, dominated national politics and threatened to cause the collapse of the Union. When Missouri asked to join the Union, the Union consisted of 22 states, 11 free states, and 11 slave states. The addition of another slave state would have shifted the legislative balance. In essence, the Missouri Compromise, struck in 1820, allowed the entry of Missouri as a slave state under the condition that Maine, which had since 1677 been the huge northern section of Massachusetts, be allowed entry into the Union as a free state, thus maintaining the balance of power. In addition, the Missouri Compromise sought to prevent future such conflicts by agreeing that, with the exception of the borders of Missouri established in 1820, slavery would be prohibited in the land of the Louisiana Purchase north of the 3630 parallel. That compromise helped to stave off the U.S. Civil War for more than 30 years. But there was a little remembered violation of the Missouri Compromise with the Platt Purchase of 1836. When the state of Missouri was finally established in 1821, the western border was a straight line that was defined by the point on the left side of the Missouri River as it met the mouth of the Caw, or what is today called the Kansas River. From that point, which is 94 degrees, 36 minutes west longitude, a line ran south and north, establishing a straight boundary between Kansas and Missouri. That placed a large section of land west of the longitude, but east of the Missouri River, that became important in the policy of Indian removal. In 1830, the U.S. had passed the Indian Removal Act. The purpose of the act was to negotiate with the native nations of the southern United States to trade their land for land west of the Mississippi. The goal was to prevent tension between the peoples, although it was of course also designed to acquire lands for settlement. The swath of land west of the Missouri border and east of the Missouri River was one such area reserved for relocation. In 1820 this was not an issue. White settlement in the area was sparse and there was an imperative for new western states to have more manageable straight line borders. But settlers quickly reached the land and by 1831 there was already pressure to settle the area, raising the risk of war with the native nations. To stave off conflict, agents, including the Superintendent of Indian Affairs, William Clark, who had been one of the leaders of the Corps of Discovery Expedition 40 years before, purchased the land from the Iowan and Sac and Fox nations, creating for them instead reservations in Nebraska and Kansas. Thus, the native people, some who had only been recently removed to that land, were again removed, and the area annexed to Missouri. This was not a small change. The land annexed in the Platte Purchase to what was already the largest state of the Union was almost as large as the states of Delaware and Rhode Island combined. As Missouri was a slave state, this amounted to an expansion of slavery north of the 3630 parallel, and thus a violation of the Missouri Compromise. Because it represented an expansion of territory where slavery was legal, the area was largely populated with settlers from slave states. But there was another, potentially explosive issue with the border of Missouri. The northern border had been defined in 1808 and 1815 treaties with the Osage Nation as the parallel of latitude which passes through the rapids of the River Des Moines. But the first attempt to survey the border in 1818 by surveyor John T. Sullivan went a tad awry. Sullivan apparently made an error by failing to account for the difference between magnetic and true north, and his line strayed northward, thus creating a slightly curved line. Then, when he reached the River Des Moines, he found a rapid. In reality, the latitude to which the treaty likely referred was the Des Moines Rapids of the Mississippi River, which was south of the Sullivan Line. Still, Sullivan defined a slightly less than straight line called the Sullivan Line. By 1837, the land along the border was being settled, and Missouri sent another surveyor to clarify the line. The surveyor, John C. Brown, started from the east end at the Des Moines River. 
However, finding no rapids that seemed to fit the treaty, he traveled north along the river until he found, in the generally calm river, a ripple that he decided apparently rather randomly presented the latitude defined in the treaty. Brown's line was, thus, about 9.5 miles north of the Sullivan line. This created a strip of disputed land at the border of the state of Missouri and the newly created territory of Iowa. Determined to maintain the Brown Line, the line most advantageous for Missouri, Missouri Governor Lilburn Boggs ordered Missouri officials to travel north to the, to the Brown Line and collect Missouri state taxes, hoping to cement his claim. Meanwhile, the governor of Iowa Territory, Robert Lucas, ordered officials to protect the state down to the Sullivan Line. Thus, when the sheriff of Clark County, Missouri, traveled north to collect taxes, he was arrested and jailed by the sheriff of Muscatine County, Iowa, on the charge of usurpation of authority. Angered, now both governors called upon units of the state militia to defend their interests, and Missouri and Iowa looked to be heading for a shooting war. The Iowa militia was brand new, and the men involved reportedly showed up with an odd assortment of weapons that included old blunderbusses, farm implements, and what was described as a sausage stuffer. The Missouri unit was a cavalry unit, and they were so ill-supplied that they had to rob a store in Missouri, which later had to be reimbursed for the loss. Fortunately, the leader of the Missouri militia, Major General David Willock, refused to start a war over an issue that should be decided by Congress. By the time the Iowa militia arrived, both states had agreed to allow Congress to decide the matter, and the Missouri militia had already gone home. Before they left, however, the disgusted Missouri militiamen had already killed both Governors Boggs and Lucas in effigy by hanging up two pieces of venison and shooting them with their muskets. Sandy Gregory, the Missouri sheriff who had been detained, was released, and the charges eventually dropped. The entire affair later was given a name over an event that may never even have occurred. According to legend, a tax collector from Missouri traveled north of the Sullivan Line and cut down three or four hollow trees filled with honeybees, claiming the honey is partial payment for the supposedly due taxes. Thus, the Iowa-Missouri War is usually called the Honey War. The border wasn't finally settled until 1849 when the issue Missouri versus Iowa reached the United States Supreme Court. The court finally decided to go back to the original, yet clearly flawed, Sullivan Line. It seems strange that just one U.S. state would have so many border disputes and changes that so represent the issues that were facing the nation at the time. But remember again, the United States is a very large nation. Missouri is the 21st largest state by size and the 18th largest state by population, but it is still larger than Greece and has a population bigger than Denmark. It played important roles in early U.S. history, in the American westward expansion, and during the U.S. Civil War. Something to keep in mind the next time that you fly over. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.